Welcome to the Third Generation Wrestling Podcast with your hosts, Eric and Rob. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Third Generation Wrestling Podcast. 3GW. We are back. The band is back together. I, I think I've finally gotten over that WrestleMania hangover. <laughs> uh, I'm your host, The Real Big E. My co-host, the ambassador, the man himself, Rob. How you doing? How's it been going? Have you gotten over Mania yet? You know what, man? It took a little bit, but yeah, I think I have. Uh, we took a little time off, but it was well-deserved, man. We were busy WrestleMania week. We uh, brought plenty of shows to the listeners, but I'm recovered now and ready to go tonight. Yeah. You know, we, between January and Mania, we did a lot of shows. We did, you know, was it four? Four road to WrestleManias in between the pay-per-views, kind of keeping, keeping up with everything and, it was inter- it's an interesting series if you go back and listen to all four of them. Um, just where we started, where we ended, and a lot of things we got right, and then a lot of things we were way off on. So <laughs> that's just that's just the nature of the beast, though. But uh, I enjoyed that time. I, I really had a good time. You guys came out here, and you know, having everybody in the same room was was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it was, man. I'm, I'm hoping we can do that again some year. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's for, for sure. Well, the next time I would rather be at WrestleMania. Well, hey, you know, you're right about that. Uh, I'm already planning to go next year because I think that's when Taker will be inducted into the Hall of Fame. But now I'm thinking that the following year in SoFi could be where maybe they induct The Rock. Yeah. You know, being that it's Hollywood. And yeah. so now I'm thinking, oh, boy, what am I going to do here? Because I, I don't think I could go two years in a row. You never know, man. You, you, you only live once. Don't, don't show it. Yeah, that's true. Show. I mean, we'll just see what happens. Uh, I'm definitely planning Dallas. But, you know, if The Rock is inducted and, uh, you know, if that dream main event that we've talked about on past podcasts between him and Roman happens, I just might have to just, even if it costs me my marriage, I just might have to do it. <laughs> I don't think that costs you that, but I mean, it's just, you know, no, no, putting no. put in a little overtime. <laughs> put in a little overtime. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think she would understand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, so we actually are doing um, something different. Something we haven't done in a while. We haven't done a, a countdown in a while, and I thought it was, it was actually something we had worked on previously, but – Never got around to doing it. So now we're do it. We were able to do it. Took a break. Coming back strong with a unique countdown. And it is the worst gimmick matches. Top ten worst gimmick matches. And this immediately when, you know, I thought about doing this, there was like four matches that came to mind right off the bat. I have them on here. And then, but the rest took some research, and there was a few on here that I actually found and watched, and had to, and I just had to put them on here because I was like, I can't believe this actually happened. But yeah, there is footage. <laughs> so for you, I mean, some we always talk about, like for you, as far as putting together your list, was it difficult, or were you like right out the bat, you just, oh, I know my ten. You know, I knew a couple, I I guess I would say, I knew a few that I wanted to put on, but it did require some research and there were some matches that like, oh, I forgot about those. So yeah, like you, there were some once I, once I was reminded of them that I was like, yeah, these have to go on the list. But there were a few that came to mind, right? About half of them, I would say came to mind right away. The rest required a little research. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I think this is a important one to do because you never know history. You know, go back and look at these matches. Some of them are absolutely hilarious. 
And some of them are just, I can't believe that this actually, what I'm watching. And of course, there are some that are just obscenely gross. <laughs> Which we will get into all of the above. Uh, so yeah, I do have one on my list that I actually saw in person. Oh, well, I definitely can't wait to hear that. Um, do you have any honorable mentions? I don't. I just have my 10. You know, there are a few I'll mention, and I'll make it very quick. I'm not going to talk about the individual matches in full detail, but um, the first honorable mention that I'm going to mention, dishonorable mention, I guess we should call them. Yeah, dishonorable um, mentions. <laughs> <laughs> right. Actually, there is a dark side of the ring about this, and this actually isn't – it's a series of matches, but it was called the Brawl for All, and it happened in 1998. And some of the contestants included Bradshaw, Draz, Bart Gunn, and it was kind of like a boxing tournament. Yeah, I remember this. You know, and it culminated with the winner, who ended up being Bart Gunn, going on to WrestleMania 15, boxing Butterbean, who was a legitimate boxer, but not like a top-notch boxer. He was more of a novelty. He, 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 he was like 400 pounds, kind of resembled King Kong Bundy, but he was a boxer. Right. Well, he ends up knocking Bart Gunn cold out in one of the most brutal knockouts you'll ever witness in any sport. And uh, But, yeah, I encourage anyone who isn't aware uh, of this to, to watch that episode of Dark Side of the Ring. It's very interesting. And then quickly I'll mention the others. Any of the strip matches, you know, we know the women have come a lot farther when I was younger, yeah. I used to, of course, I used to love those watching women rip each other clothes off. Hey, I'm a, I'm a grandfather now to granddaughters, and you know, so I look at things differently. Um, any match where you put something on a pole? Yeah, yeah. Those uh, are always, almost always bad. Yeah. Admittedly, um, I almost put some, but I, I I don't have any of those on my list. But I definitely was looking at a few. Yeah. And then look, a couple of recent ones. Look, we just watched saw one. A Nigerian drum fight, which we had never heard of before. There were drums outside of the ring, but they weren't used in the match. <laughs> Mostly just Kindle sticks. To me, this was just a way to, you know, Apollo Creed's going with his true heritage, going with his ni true Nigerian heritage as part of his character. So they incorporated this into a match at WrestleMania. To me, it really didn't work. Um, Look, the exploding barbed wire match that we saw between Omega Man. and Moxley. Yeah. Maybe past ones have been great. I've never seen one before, but this one was absolute garbage. So that's on the list. And then the last one I'll mention, look, everybody knows how I feel about them. And I don't know if they're considered gimmick matches, but to me they are cinematic matches. That, that yeah. I, I hate them. And I'm hoping that now we're getting crowds back we won't see as many. So those are my dishonorable mentions. Well, those are very valid ones. I feel like uh, the the they don't do them anymore. Or at least they haven't in a long time. The the on the pole matches, yeah, those were always it, it was never good. Um, no. And obviously, yes, that that we could go on and on about how that exploding barbed wire match did not go well. Um, I'm sure there are some that did. So that's why I didn't put it down here. But that one in particular, like, it, it, it had the potential. But again, like I said, I don't want to get into it because we'll be here all night. <laughs> yeah, and if we've already done a podcast about that particular yeah. match. So if you want to know how we felt about it, you can revisit our, our podcast reviewing, uh, what was it, AEW, was it Revolution? Revolution, yeah. Go yeah. go back in, to the archives, AEW Revolution post-show. We got into it, trust me. <laughs> All right, sir. Well, kicking it off here with our top 10 worst gimmick matches. And just as our other countdown hosts would do, I'm going to let you kick it off, sir, number 10. Do the honors. Okay. I guess I should say some of these, how I did my countdown is some of these are just the type, this gimmick match in general. Some of them I, I pick specific matches, but my number 10 is the blindfold match. 
<laughs> it doesn't matter who the contestants were. Anytime you had these matches, it was more comical than anything because obviously the guys can't see. So they're pawing around. You've got guys punching the ref. You got yeah. guys yelling at the turnbuckle. You've got very few wrestling moves because obviously the guys are blindfolded and it's dangerous to do a move where you can't see what you're doing. Yeah. And they were always terrible, uneventful, sometimes comical, but usually just terrible. And so that's my number 10. Any type of blindfold match. Yeah, and I'm in the same boat with you. Some of these matches on my list are specific, and some are just in general. And like you, I'm kicking off with one that is uh, just in general. Now, I know you weren't a big WCW guy, but I, maybe you're familiar with this match. It was the World War Three match, which is kind of WCW's Royal Rumble. Uh, it was, if you can picture this, three rings, three rings, 60, <laughs> 60 competitors, and it's one giant battle royal. So there's not a, you know, every 60 seconds somebody comes down. They just fill the ring with everybody. And it's three rings that you have to keep track of. And it's impossible. Now, the winner of the match is kind of like Royal Rumble, like I said. The winner of the match got a World Championship title shot at Starcade, which would be the following month. The biggest problem with this match was you couldn't keep up. There's not enough camera angles to watch three rings and 60 people getting tossed out. It was always a shit show. Uh... The, but I will say this, the three ring, how they look, you know, set up was cool, but the execution never really lived up to it. Um, and the, obviously WCW pay-per-views weren't the greatest to begin with. So the only World War Three I watched was 1998 when, when Kevin Nash won. He would go on to face Goldberg, and we all know how that ended, so. Yeah. Wow. No, I, I never saw that. Uh, maybe I have to go back and revisit. Maybe, maybe, maybe I shouldn't. But now you got me curious. Well, just just Google World War WCW World War Three, and just look at the three ring concept, and that's all you'll need to see. <laughs> okay. All right. So coming up in number nine. Number nine for me. I realized doing this countdown that a lot of my matches were like during the attitude era, like that, that 90 late nine, mid nineties, late nineties yep, era. Yep. Yep. This one is from 1999, no mercy. And it was the good housekeeping match. Between oh yeah. <laughs> China and Jeff Jarrett. I love that match. <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? Look, man. Some of the weapons used in this match, okay, you have brooms, brooms, you had ironing boards, kitchen sinks. Yep. <laughs> trying to put the toilet seat around Jeff Jarrett's head. Yep. I mean, man, that match was that was absolute garbage, Eric. <laughs> absolute garbage. That was terrible. Oh man. That is funny. Oh, I used to watch that match over and over again. And didn't China have what's her name with her too? Her little uh minion. Ah, uh, I can't think oh, of gosh. Was it the cat? Yeah, the cat. Yeah. Oh, man, yes. Yeah, I love Jeff Jarrett and China's feud. I don't know why, but especially that match. That was iconic to me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but wow. I get why people – well, maybe I shouldn't use the word iconic, but it just stood out. I just thought it was funny. And it's not a, it's not a wrestling clinic. It's not a classic by any stretch of the imagination. But it is hilarious. <laughs> well, you're right about that. Look, most of these matches weren't meant to be well, weren't meant to be classic. I think most of them were supposed to be silly, stupid, um, and I felt like this one was, and 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 it was. So, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but had to go on the list though. I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you think that's bad, my number nine, 
I couldn't believe was a real thing. And this is one I found while doing my research. And I, I, I'm wondering if it's one you watched. Talking about Razor Ramon versus one, two, three kid, the crybaby match. <laughs> so this is back in 1995 in your house, I believe, was the pay per view. And it was one, two, three kid versus Razor Ramon. The loser would have a diaper put on them. And that was that was a stipulation. I think uh uh I forgot uh one two three kids manager at the time, but Ted DiBiase was his manager at the time. And so Razor Ramon won the match. He had two razor's edges on <laughs> one, two, three kid, and literally he gets down like you're changing a infant's diaper, splits one, two, three kids' legs, <laughs> <laughs> douses him in baby powder, oh, no. and wraps him up in this giant, it had to be a towel, but it wound up being a giant diaper. And one, two, three kid gets up, and he's just in shock the fact that he's covered in baby powder and got a diaper on and he starts crying. Yeah. Fucking terrible. It was, it was, it was very, this was actually very cringy because I just couldn't believe what I was looking at. And I was like, yep, yep, yep. That's got to go on there because this is awful. Um, Somehow, some way. Huh? No, I'm sorry. You said that was at In Your House 95? I think so. I, I might be wrong on the pay per view, but it was in '95. Okay, because I have, 25. I have a match on my list that it's not that match that you're talking about, but I have a match on my list from In Your House '95. But yeah, that Crybaby match didn't make my list. I I do not recall that one. Uh, I'm glad that I don't. Um, yeah, you're not missing nothing, brother. Okay, I mean, it I, I, I found it doing research, and I'm like, wow. Yeah, gotta put it on here though. Had to be on there. All right, number eight. Well, number eight, this is one I think most people are going to be very familiar with. And this is the Punjabi prison match. Yes. Okay, now the first one, the the whole concept of this was designed because of Great Khali. He, He was having a pretty good run in WWE at this time. He was supposed to take on Big Show. Believe it or not, uh, apparently... He had a medical condition. His uh, liver enzymes were elevated, so he couldn't do the match that he it, that was designed for him. So it ended up being Big Show and Taker. But then later on, uh, Great Kali took on Batista in a Punjabi prison. And then as recently as 2017, we yeah. had Jinder Mahal fight Randy Orton. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Jinder Mahal was champion at the time. He fought Randy Orton in a Punjabi prison. He wins due to outside interference from the great Kali. So there have been three of these matches. To me, none of them very good. Nope. And hopefully with uh, great Kali being retired, who's also a Hall of Famer, <laughs> you know, whether you like it or not, um, hopefully we won't see that match anymore. But yeah, that made my number eight, the Punjabi prison. Yeah, that is definitely on my list. Uh, a little bit later, so I'll get into it then. But uh, yeah, I will, yeah, yeah, definitely on there. Okay, my number eight, and I couldn't believe this was a real thing back in 2014. So a little more recent, going back to the TLC from 2014, the tables, ladders, chairs, and stairs. The stairs match between Eric Rowan and Big Show. This was absolutely <laughs> fucking stupid. It is, it's, it's the same deal as if it was a chairs match. You can legally use the steel steps, which don't they use steel steps in normal matches anyway? So I don't I don't get it, but yeah, these two clunked around. This match was awful. It's so bad it's not even worth me taking the time to rewatch it again. Uh but Big Show got the win over Eric Rowan. 
I, I, I think they added, if I recall, they added the whole stairs thing at the, like the last minute, the final hour, and then they added that match. I don't know if Vince was high or on some shit, and he was like, hey, tables, ladders, chairs, and stairs. Do it. And, of course, the big show will be the guinea pig for that match. Yeah. If 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 I don't see I don't foresee us doing a, a retrospective on that show, but if we ever do, it's a fucking F. <laughs> yeah, man, I agree. And I remember that match. To me, the whole thing stupid about it is that whenever you have a match that's a TLC match, isn't it anything goes anyway? Yep. I mean, so you don't need to include the stairs in the I mean, aren't those already legal anyway? Right. Yeah. Okay, but still, moving on. All right, and we're up to number seven, right? My number seven. Yep. Okay, well, now we're up to the match that I actually witnessed this in person. This was at SummerSlam 99. This was Billy Gunn and one of my all-time favorites, The Rock. (laughs) The Kiss My Ass match. I forgot. I don't know how I forgot about that. Yes. Now, look, the build-up to this is great because Rock is so good in these promos. Billy Gunn must have felt like the lowest person on earth because Rock is just killing him whenever these two are doing promos together. Now, the match is originally supposed to be, first of all, it's bad enough. The loser of the match is supposed to kiss the other wrestler's ass. So either Billy Gunn is supposed to kiss Rock's ass or Rock is supposed to kiss Billy Gunn's ass. Right. Well, at the end of the match, Billy Gunn thinks he has the Rock reel and he thinks, okay, I think I'm ready to win this one. But instead of trying to make the Rock kiss his ass, he brings in this woman who we don't know. I mean, she's older. She's heavier. Mm-hmm. Um, she's a big, she's wearing big stockings and black panties. <laughs> he puts her in the corner, attempts to put Rock's face into her butt, but uh, no, Rock is able to reverse it and rubs Billy Gunn's face into this all old in ass, ass who really seems to be enjoying it because she has this big ass grin on her face the mm-hmm. whole time. And the Rock lands the Rock bottom. The People's Elbow, one, two, three, Rock wins. Um, I don't know if I need to say any more about that. Mm-mm. First of all, any match where you're telling me one guy is going to kiss the other guy's ass, I- I'm already tuned out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then you bring in this old, out of shape lady, ass all flabby, pasty, nasty, and, and Billy Gunn gets his face rubbed in it. Yeah, man, I'm glad I was sitting – we were up top for that one. I'm kind of glad. Well, I remember that pay-per-view vividly. Uh, And when it was leading up to the feud and everything, I I was just like, are they really going to have two grown-ass men? Oh, oh, one of the grown-ass men kiss the other one's ass? I mean, I know in the past – and this was – if I if I did have honorable mentions, this would have made it, you know, the whole Bret Hart versus Jerry King Lawler, um, kiss my foot match, like that I was like okay that to that point that'd have been the nastiest thing, but this was like kiss my ass. So when they when Billy Gunn brought up, came out with this, well she was covered like you said in a cloak, so we didn't know what the hell it was. And then, yeah, she was rather large and a rather large ass. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was distinct face before Rikishi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was. And uh yeah, that saw that one in person, not proud of it. But look, man, SummerSlam ninety nine, you know, it had some okay moments. Our I very first, very it. first retrospective was SummerSlam 1999. Yeah, I don't regret seeing it, uh, but I do regret seeing this match. <laughs> I, I have fond memories of that pay per view. That was, I guess, one of them. It was, it was funny. Yeah. Well, my number seven was one you mentioned, the Punjabi Prison match. Like you said, man, um, they just never got it right, and I think. I had high hopes for it, especially when it was Batista versus Greg Kali. I'm like, okay, Batista's big enough. 
It was in Chicago. Um, I remember that one. I have that DVD actually, No Mercy, here in Chicago. And I just remember it just being like, this is just boring. So the, the whole concept was it was bamboo. The cage was made of bamboo, and there's a there's an inner cage and an outer cage. And it was it was it was a decent concept because you could fight in between the cages and, and the whole but the only way to win was to escape. You had to escape both cages. There was no doors. You literally had to climb over the top. And I think that's probably why it it, it couldn't work. Because there was no pinfalls, there were no submissions. You had to climb over and it's a little anticlimactic if both opponents are on opposite sides of the cage trying to climb not one, but two cages you had to get out of. So it's it was trash. Um all, and, and and both of them. I don't know why they brought it back, but like you said, Randy Orton and Jinder Mahal. I just maybe it was, you know, to spice things up, but again, it just didn't hit. It didn't hit. I think the I'll say the Randy and Jinder was better, but you know, we're looking at apples and oranges. Two rotten apples and oranges. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah. Definitely the Punjabi prison match. Made the list. That's my number seven. All right. All right. My number six. And th- this goes back to early WCW days. This is the mid eighties. Oh boy. Yeah, it had two different names. The scaffold match. Oh. Some call it the Skywalker match. Yeah. Now, I did not watch a lot of WCW, but now the concept of this, it so intrigued me that I was curious enough to watch. And the concept is that you have a scaffold, not very wide, 20 feet above the ring. And there are only two ways to win. It's tag team match usually. And either you have to knock both members of the opposite team off of the scaffold, or they have flags placed on each team has a flag placed in there at the end of their scaffold. And if you can go over and get the other team's flag and bring it back to your end, then you win the match. Now, the problem with the match is that, look, you're 20 feet in the air and you're on this scaffold that's only a few feet wide. So, obviously, the guys are being very careful. They don't want to fall. But you're not going to see body slams. You're not going to see clotheslines. You're not going to see big moves because the guys are gingerly walking across this this scaffold, trying not to fall. Right. And it's just boring. It's just boring to watch because you're waiting for something big to happen. And even if the guys fall off, and, and I don't want to sound like a ghoul because, look, I don't want to see a guy injured. But most of the time the guys fell off. What they're doing is that they somehow managed to get their hands on the scaffold with their bodies hanging almost all the way to the bottom, and then they land on their feet when they fall. Okay, it's not like one guy is throwing another guy off the scaffold and he's landing on his back like, you know, like we've seen happen in some matches later. I'm, I'm thinking of Undertaker and Foley when I talk what, about this. What about, what about um, uh, New Jack? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, stuff like that. So the match was really kind of just boring and anticlimactic because what you want to see, sadly, you want to see a guy fall 20 feet, land yeah. on his back, but you're not going to see that, okay? You're not going to see that. And these matches were always a disappointment. And and you usually might see the team win by grabbing the flag and getting it to their other side. So you're not going to see anybody fall at all. But that's the whole reason people tune in to see these matches. You want to see someone fall off the scaffold. Like, 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 like the reason people watch NASCAR and, and Formula 1, Formula 500, I think it's called, to see a crash. People want to see a demolition derby. Yeah. You know, we, we there was a UFC card on the other night. Good card. Lots of knockouts. When you watch a sport like that, you get excited when you see the big knockouts. 
Yeah. Well, when you watch a match like this, you want to see a dude fall. When a dude doesn't fall, it's a disappointment, and you hardly ever saw a dude fall. So, yeah, that made my number six, the Scaffold, a.k.a. Skywalker match. Yeah, well, I never saw any of those, but uh, I'm going to keep in the trend that we're on here with WCW because back in 2000, Vince Russo had an idea for a new concept for War Games 2000. Now, the original match for War Games, we all know it's the two cages side by side, you know, that type of deal. This, however, he decided instead of doing cages side by side, he was going to stack them. And instead of two cages, it was going to be three. So that, the the three, the triple cage you saw in Ready to Rumble is was a real match that aired on WCW. It was War Games 2000, Russo's Revenge. And pretty much, it's, it's, it's so stupid. It's... It looks eerily like like it did in the movie. It's it's five. It's two teams of five about, and they put the championship title in the top cage, which is the smallest cage. So it looks like a pyramid. Um, and the whole the winner is the person that walks out of the bottom cage with the championship. It's it's so bad. Like this, the one I'm speaking of specifically. Um, Kevin Nash was the champion at the time, and you know there were people in their big names in there. You know, Sting, Booker T, Goldberg's, uh, you know, all those type of people. And of course, my man Goldberg was tear tore up the field and was about to win the match. And of course, Vince Russo had to slam the door in his face, and Kevin Nash ended up winning the match, and it, it was just. It was always a shit show when Vince Russo was around. This, this, and the reason why the main reason why this match is on my list is because David Arquette, the actor David Arquette, has won one of these fucking things, and that's why it's on here. It's awful. You put over an actor over all your other wrestlers. It's one thing to do it in a goofy, off script kind of match like like with Bad Bunny and The Miz and you know if you're going to do Big Show versus Floyd Mayweather um, you know those type of things but there's no championship involved fine but when you're putting a celebrity as a champion huge problem with that and that's why it's on here it's my number six so you know before we get to the you know the top five really we get we get really goofy with my top five so uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, just as a quick aside before I, we get to the top five, because like you said, my top five is when it really starts to get really yeah. crazy. Um, Vince Russo, the bra for all that I mentioned in my dishonorable mentions, that concept was his idea. And if you watch the Dark Side of the Ring episode that I spoke about, you'll find out the whole reason why he came up with that concept, really a silly reason. Um, but yeah, that, that was his idea. So apparently Vince Rousseau was just full of, uh, terrible ideas for wrestling matches. Oh yeah. yeah. All right. But moving on to number five, and this is going back to 1995, an episode of raw. This is a tuxedo match. (laughs) I was wondering if you're going to have this. Oh man. Look between the late (laughs) great Howard Finkel, Howard Finkel and, uh, and Harvey Whippleman, who was a semi-famous manager at the time the object of the match is to you look got both guys walk out in tuxedos obviously and the object of the match is to strip the guy out of his tuxedo down to his draws and so to see <laughs> both of these guys look neither one of them are really in good shape not that it mm-hmm. would make a difference if they were uh, look, man, they're out of shape. They're, they're pasty. Um, for whatever reason, both of them was wearing red underwear. It was ugly. I mean, it uh. was, it was, I mean, it, it was just a terrible thing to watch. 
Um, Look, obviously, it's supposed to be silly, funny. I guess you could say it was all that. To me, it was just gross, nasty. Um, but, yeah, the, the tuxedo match from Raw 1995, number five on my list. Yeah, I saw that a lot doing research, and it was tough not to put that on here, but I have my reasons, and we'll get to them later. We will definitely get there later. Okay. Uh, so my number five is still kind of um, a little toned down, but it pissed me off. This match really pissed me off. I had, I remember looking forward to this match, and I was very, very disappointed. And they've done better work now because both men are with a different company now. And I'm talking about the Ambrose Asylum match with Extreme Rules 2016, Dean Ambrose versus Chris Jericho. This is one of the matches that inspired me to do this countdown because it was so bad. You went on and on about this past WrestleMania, how Shane McMahon had the little bags at the top of the cage and he has little tools in there. And I, I'll admit, you know, a cookie sheet, if you're going to do that, you know, have tools up there, He's had some good shit, not no cookie sheet, you know. But the whole point of the asylum match was the whole top of the cage was strapped with all kinds of weapons, kindle sticks, chairs, barbed wire bats, all that good stuff. The problem was if you wanted a weapon, you had to climb to the top and then come back down to use the weapon. And that just made for a long, drawn-out, boring match. It's it's it just didn't work. The concept didn't work. It sounded good on paper. It really did. And I, I won't say the two men didn't try because they did. It just didn't play out well. The only good bump from the match was when Chris Jericho took that nasty bump on the thumbtacks, and that led to Dirty Deeds and uh, Dean Ambrose won. But outside of that, I mean, that the ending was was great, but the match was awful. So, yeah, that definitely made the list. And it was on a lot of lists that I saw when I was doing research for this. Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah, unfortunately, I remember that one. It it didn't make my list. But when I get to my top four, maybe you'll see why. Yeah. Um, So moving on to number four. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Moving on to number four. I just spoke about the tuxedo match between the great Howard Uh Finkel and Uh Harvey Whippleman. Well, at King of the Ring 2000, yep. we had a hardcore evening gown match. Now, the, when you think evening gowns, usually you'll think female. No. This was an evening gown match between the late, great Pat Patterson and yep. Gerald Briscoe. Now, as the match is going, going on, as they start to strip each other out of the evening gowns, each of them are wearing bras and panties. Okay? <laughs> yes, yes. Wait. Okay, this is on my list, too, so I'm trying not to say anything. Okay, well, I won't say hard. too much. It, no, go ahead. It is so hard not to, because this is... Whew. Man, look, to me, the only saving grace of this match is that once again, you know, I've said this about three times in, in the past five minutes. The late Crash Holly comes down to the ring and interrupts the match and luckily wins the match. I mean, he wasn't originally in the match, but I guess it's a hardcore match. It's an evening gown match. I guess anything goes. He comes down. He wins. Thank God. Puts an end to all of this horrible carnage, all, all, all of this, this, this just – Terrible. <laughs> Just, it was a shit show, man. Look, I couldn't man, believe what the fuck I was watching. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just. And if you know what you know about Pat Patterson, you're just thinking all kinds of stuff. You're just like, man, Gerald Briscoe, you a good friend. <laughs> That's all yeah, I. Can. I was trying not to go there because, look, the man's passed away, and. Uh, I mean, but, that's his truth. Yeah, you know, it's just. Like I said, sometimes what bothers me about matches like this is that as a, as a real wrestling fan, I'm always thinking, if I'm trying to bring someone into wrestling who maybe has never watched a match before, mm-hmm. and I'm like, hey, man, you know, or, or FEMA, whoever, you, you know, 
there's a big wrestling card on tonight, man. You want to check it out? You know, I enjoy wrestling. Maybe you will. And then you have to, they have to see something like this, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't, we, I, just, I don't think we would see anything like that today. No, you're right. But, you're right. yeah. Yeah, but, so yeah, so that's my number four. The hardcore evening gown match, Briscoe versus Patterson, King of the Ring 2000. <laughs> Terrible, sickening, uh, horrible. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, hmm. it's, it's, it's some, there's things in that match you'll never unsee. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, watch it at your own risk. I will yeah, say that. Yeah, yeah, I'll talk about it here in a bit. But I'm surprised you haven't mentioned this one. My number four. And uh, we're about to get into your favorite subject on this podcast. About to get into some dookie. Um, <laughs> so first up, we got 19, oh, so this, actually, this might be on your, your countdown. Um, Henry O. Goblin versus Triple H with Hillbilly Jim as a referee, the hog pin match. Jesus. <laughs> um, and I'm like, really? Triple H was in one of these? And, and, and then, oh, oh, your favorite, Hillbilly Jim was the referee, of course. You know, it, it it was a regular match, but of course, well, the first half of it was regular, and then they fought over by the pig pen. There's actual live pigs, and it's it it's it's everything. There's mud. <laughs> there's pig slop, so you know there's pig shit <laughs> mixed in there too. I can imagine being in attendance for one of these. I would be gagging the entire time. I don't do well on farm. <laughs> I don't go, look, anytime somebody wants to go horseback riding or go to see farm, and I'm like, <laughs> when I start smelling shit, it's over with. <laughs> okay. Um, so I can't even imagine, and this is me. I'm talking about me going to visit and I'm just walking through. I can't imagine being tossed in the pig pen with the fucking pigs and Triple H. God bless you, man. He went face first into the, into the, I know it's mostly mud, but come on, man. You know, it's, it's mixed in with all type of, yeah unmentionable things that I can't even imagine the type of bath and shower he took after getting out of there. And then he up there just slipping and sliding and falling down in it after the fact. He won the match but doing a back body drop to Old Godwin. So he did win. But he got thrown in there, of course, because that's, you know, WWE has to do that. You know, the heel has to get, you know, they got to be covered in shit too. <sighs> This yeah. was just gross. <laughs> well, you know what? You gave me the perfect lead in. My number three is the hog pin match. It took place at In Your House, 1995, and he was Hunter Hearst Helmsley at the time. He had not gone by the moniker Triple H to this point. He was the aristocrat. He, yeah. he was proper, and yeah. And so that's, that's part of the whole point of this match. He was undefeated at the time. Mm -hmm. He had this little undefeated streak going. And yeah, the, the object of the match was to throw your opponent in slop, Henry Godwin, who, who at the time had a little, you know, little popularity going. So they, they gave him this match. But yeah, Triple H also also bled in this match. Uh, he, oh, his back, yeah. He took a bump on his back. I think it was when I had to rewind it. And, and I think there was a, a segment where he got slammed against the back of the pin. And it, I think the metal from the pin actually cut his back. Yeah, his back was bleeding. Yeah, yeah. so in addition to, uh, you know, going into all that slop and, and pig shit, you know, he did it with cuts on his back. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, that made my number three, so that was the perfect lead-in. I don't think I need to say anymore. You said it all. Ugh. I'd, I would just be so scared of an infection. <laughs> my back's cut up. 
Now I'm rolling around in pig mud and shit. <laughs> nah, Michael Ugh. H got all up in it. All up in it, man. Now no, I and mean, he had long, long hair back then. Ugh. Oh man. Okay. Well, I guess it is a appropriate segue into my next match, and there was no way I could leave this off. So we go from pig shit to dog shit. The dog poop match. The British Bulldog versus The Rock. And I think this was at No Mercy 1999. This is this was absolutely <laughs> disgusting to even imagine. And I mean, I don't know where they got this this dog shit from. This was like full blown horse shit. On a, it was on a slab, and I want to say British Bulldog brought it out with him, and well, you know how it goes. What you bring to the ring is what you end up taking a bump on, and that's how the match ended with the British Bulldog taking a rock bottom onto a gigantic pile of dog shit. I'm not making this up. This is it's actually happened. I ugh, I just remember watching this as a kid, and again, I'm just thinking I would be throwing up. Like book, remember when Booker? T- <laughs> remember, I can't remember what match that was. Oh, I do now. Remember when Booker T got a stink face from Ricky? Oh man. <laughs> He threw up all over Michael Cole. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, that was hilarious to me. Whew. Oh, my God, because it was real. He really threw up. I think he was the only person that actually threw up. Oh, that is funny. Whew. But, yes, I would have been him. I would have been, like, seriously gagging and throwing up. And British Bulldog didn't. Didn't like Hunter. He he went back flat, head all in the shit, and just mm. Mm -mm -mm. yeah. More power to you. Rest in peace, and congratulations on getting in the Hall of Fame this year. Um, Sorry you had to endure this shitty match. Pun intended. (laughs) Well, look, I'm about to give my list away because that one did make my list. However, it is not my number two. So obviously, you know what number, it's my number one. Yeah. But before I get to that, I will talk about the Kennel from Hell match from Unforgiven 1999 between the Big Boss Man and Al Snow. Now, the whole concept of the match, and, and there's a backstory, and I'll try to make this quick. Um, Al Snow, we all know he used to come to the ring with head, okay? Mm-hmm. But they did a storyline between him and Boss Man. Al Snow had a dog. I think it was a Chihuahua. His name Pepper. Chihuahua, yeah. Yeah, well, at, at one time, Big Boss Man stole his dog. Mm-hmm. And Al Snow would do promos, you know, begging for, just please return my dog. Please, 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 Big Boss Man, return my dog. And Big Boss Man said, okay, look. Look, dude, come on. I'm going to invite you for lunch. You know, look, we're going we're gonna to make this right. I'm going to invite you for lunch. I've cooked you some spaghetti with meat in it. I want you to eat it, and and we're going to make everything right. Well, Al Snow is just grubbing on this on this spaghetti with this meat in it. Mm. And then Big Show lets you know, hey, by the way, the meat, it's pepper. Mm-hmm. Al Snow basically ate his own dog. Yeah. Okay, so that led to this match. So you have – a wrestling ring surrounded by um, a cage and like a hell in the cell thing with supposedly rabid dogs all around the ring. Yeah. So that way, like if you get, apparently if you get thrown out of the ring, these dogs are just going to viciously attack you, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So these guys are wrestling. These dogs could care less than a damn about what's going on. <laughs> They're trying to hump each other. They're peeing. Yeah. Some of them are shitting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, they could care wait. less about what's going on in the ring. Wait. Okay. 
we already here. It's my number two. So Okay. <laughs> so you can you can pick up where I left off. <laughs> Look, the idea is it sounds cool, right? You got the cage, the blue cage on the on the inside, and then the hell in the cell coming down, and then there's gonna be Rottweilers in between. Yeah, they failed to mention that these Rottweilers are gonna be coming out on leashes with handlers the entire time. They this ain't dogs running free now, because obviously they can't do that with you know an audience. But yeah, like you said, these dogs could give a fuck about them two people in the ring. They out there spraying and pissing and shitting and fucking. Okay? <laughs> they like, why are we out here? What is going on? They don't care. Nothing about this match. Boss man tried to escape through the top of the Hell in a Cell and you see Al Snow escape with his life because lord knows that person holding the leash wasn't gonna let him leave i mean it's it's so stupid i mean what could have been and, and, and it was one of those way out there stipulations it looked cool i'll say that much that was probably the only thing about that match. It looked cool. You got a cage inside of Hell in a Cell. It looks cool. And the idea of having dogs in between. Maybe maybe if they would just would have done Rottweilers. I mean, why you got to go with the mo- one of the most dangerous dogs ever? Just, you know, Pepper was a Chihuahua. Why not get some Chihuahuas? I don't know. Yeah. Well, you that, know, man. That was my number. Ain't the most vicious dogs. Please, my neighbor has one, and that dog's an asshole. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, I guess I'm just saying, if you're going to have a menacing match, I don't know if, if I get excited about it. You know, I mean, if you're telling me I'm going to get attacked by a bunch of chihuahuas, I'm like, uh, okay, look, man, they got small, sharp teeth. It'll hurt. But if you're telling me I'm getting attacked by some Rottweilers or some pit bulls, I'm like, oh, maybe that's a match I'm not going to do. Yeah, but I mean, when you come out, they're not like, like I said, these dogs weren't just let loose. There's people in there on and had these dogs on leashes the entire time. It's, it's, it's bad. It's bad. If you were in the first few rows of that card, I mean, yeah. I mean, you probably had to be getting sick. Them dogs are just making a mess around that ring. Yeah, it's like F this thing. I mean, and yeah, I mean, what did, what did they expect? What do they really expect? But, yep. Yeah. All right. That was my number two. So, uh, okay. You just... Well, look, man, I'm really curious about your number one because my number one was the dog poo match. And I hated to see – this was like one of – this was like the final run of Davy Boy Smith. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was kind of it for him. Yeah. And, dude, this is what you go away with. Yeah. You know, any match where the object is to slam the other wrestler in a pile of shit. I mean, you know <laughs> that. I mean, come on. That's just a terrible, terrible match. And I think if if I remember correctly, I think this actually happened on an episode of Raw. And I think, and this, I don't know why it seemed appropriate to me, but this was when the Rock and Sock connection was a big thing. And I believe it was Foley who brought out this huge platter of, of to me, what looked like real shit. I don't, I, I guess you can make fake shit. I don't know how you do. I'm to this day. I'm not sure whether it was real or fake. Well, it, the way Jerry Lawler was at the, see back then, Jerry Lawler was a fantastic commentator because he would play into stuff like this and he would make you believe that that was real shit. Now, whether it was, it wasn't, I don't know. It could have been chocolate, but it looked real to me. It did to me too, too real, but I'm sorry, man. Any match where the object is to slam your opponent and shit, that that's going to make my number one because that is a match. <laughs> I'm so, I am not doing that match <laughs> unless you're you guaranteeing me that that's a pile of chocolate I'm landing in. I'm not doing that match. That's just terrible, and it's just juvenile. It's gross. I, I hate that The Rock was a part of that. 
Yeah. I hate that Davy Boy, like I said, in, in what was one of his last matches in WWE, it might have been his absolute last match. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, for him to go out on that note, just terrible, man. Yeah, th- th- those weren't the right two guys to be doing silly-ass shit like that. No pun intended on this one. But um, I-, I still thought it was funny. <clears throat> Yeah, it was to me. It was disrespectful. I thought I thought Davy Boy came back with a different gimmick. He wore jeans and boots. He was ripped up. Um, and he was a really good heel. Could cut good promos against the Rock. Um, yeah, yeah. It was. It was. It's just gross. And I, and I think that was real dog shit. I really do. You know what? I've heard that it was. I don't know if it's an urban legend or just, but, but that's what I've heard. Yeah. It, w- it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me. Okay. So my number one, you did mention it earlier and doing research. This was by far the worst match that I saw even worse than dog shit. In my opinion, the hardcore evening gown match <laughs> with Pat Patterson and Jared Briscoe. This was this was awful for every reason imaginable. The, the wrestling was bad. The dresses were bad. And if that's not enough, you couldn't just wear dresses, you know, and just do the gimmick, right? Y'all got on bras and panties, too. And I, I, if I remember correctly, Pat Paris had on makeup. You know, it it was, look. It was absolutely awful. It was acid nine, acid ten. It was disgusting to see. I mean, I, uh, uh, Crash Holly saved the day. I was a big Crash Holly fan back in the day. Anyway, rest in peace. Um, but he definitely said the day came out, won the match, and I was just chanting, "Thank you, Crash," because that was. I have no words. It is off. I, I'm I'm just imagining, and this is what I mean when we talked about earlier. There's things in this match you cannot unsee. <laughs> and that's why it's number one. I can kind of push everything else out of my head. Not that one. It 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 just mm-mm. so it's one of those matches where I don't recommend it. If you if you have a certain um, if you hold Pat Paris and Jared Briscoe in some high esteem, don't watch this match because you will never see them the same again. Okay, um, whether somebody it doesn't matter. Somebody's sex, the sexual orientation does not matter. These two look like idiots in this match. Okay, I don't need to see any grown man dressed the way they were dressed. One minute period. It's my number one. Awful. Yeah, for me, it's not even about Pat Patterson's preference because at the time I saw this match, I wasn't even aware of his preference. All I see are two old ass men dressed yeah. in gowns and in bras and in panties. I mean, I kind of see your point with the dog poo match. Pretty much, look, it, it's a basic wrestling match until. Foley walks out with this big platter of dog poo, and then we see Davy Boy get slammed in it. This match was kind of an eyesore from beginning to end. So mm-hmm. having that as your number one, I can't really argue with that. But, it's, yeah, it, it's just – I tell you what, man. As much as we complain about WWE, and justifiably so, uh, I'm glad that we don't see things like this anymore. Uh, yeah. Um. And and this is part of the reason, and I think I've said this on the podcast a few times. I, I don't. I'm not as fond of the Attitude Era as a lot of people because I remember too many things like these. I mean, <laughs> like over half of the matches that I had on my list are from the Attitude Era. I just don't yeah. remember it as fondly as a lot of people. I think people remember when they think of Attitude Era, they remember The Rock, Stone Cold, Shawn Michaels, maybe. Bret Hart toward the end, Undertaker, you know, Triple H was making his name, Mick Foley. 
they remember those names. They don't really remember the undercard and the mid card, you know, um, as fondly. But I, I just think that 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 WWE knew how to book a main event better back in the day than they do now. Now they probably had more foolishness back then than they do now, even though it may not feel like it. Because we're here now and we're watching it now. But when you go back and you look at all this shit, I mean, we only listed 10 matches. I guarantee there's way more between WCW, WWE, and, and, and all the other companies. So, yeah. Definitely a definitely a good list. I, I figured we would have some of those in common. Um I yeah. I figured the dog poop was one. And I and I, I for sure thought the evening guy match for sure was one too. But uh yeah, you know, it, all these countdowns we've done, we've always had at least one or two in common. So Yeah, I figured some are so incredibly bad. I, I, you just knew there had to be a couple that match up, but like the crybaby match. That's one I didn't have on my list. I, yeah. I might have to go watch some some highlights or low lights of that one. I don't know if I watched the whole match, but yeah, that's one I'll definitely have to go revisit because I don't remember that one. Well, I might be able to send you a link because I, I watched it on YouTube. So, because I'm still trying to navigate Peacock and I I am still hating it, hating it. It's wow, really? Because I I haven't really messed with Peacock since we've watched Mania. There hasn't been a pay per view. Uh, I've been meaning to watch the Broken Skull sessions with Jericho, but I I haven't really tried to navigate the lab library yet. Yeah, if you're going for an original like that one or a recent pay per view, it's right at the home page. But if you're trying to go in the archives, good fucking luck. Well, you know what? I'm just hoping that they get their act together because what I've heard is that it's new to the platform. They're still working things out. I will say that for my $9.99, in addition to getting the WWE library, I'm getting all this other stuff that Peacock offers, most of which I, I don't really watch to this point. But uh, I, one thing I do notice, it is it is harder finding the pay-per-views because what used to be searched by year and title of pay-per-view, now mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, it, it's trickier now. You have to find a pay-per-view instead of saying the year and giving you a cover art so you know what it kind of is. It's uh, season. It'll season say season, one. season one, right. a thousand times. So I have to go through and literally guess which one it could be it was not the right one at the back out and then keep guessing it is so not user friendly i don't know who said oh yeah let's do this this will be great and because the last wwe network upgrade i thought was fantastic because i could jump jump to a match i could easily find old stuff just by typing it in on peacock there's no way to search for anything on WWE Network. No way. And I was and I was going to say that I don't think like like you said if you're watching a certain show, you can jump to a match or to a segment. And I don't believe you can do that on no. Peacock. You have to fast forward. Yeah. So it, it it's it's worse technology than VCR. Cuz at least in the VCR, I can press play and hit fast forward and I can see where I want to stop. I can't even see where I want to stop on Peacock. Yeah. I'll I'll cut them some slack because it's new. But if we're still talking about it like this by SummerSlam, then I'm like, okay. Look, I'm not going to – I'm not going to – obviously, I'm not going to get rid of my subscription. For me, it's not so bad because even with the network, mostly what I watch it for, I'm paying my $9.99 to see my free pay-per-views. So – and the original content. So for me, not so bad, but like we do retrospectives. And so it's going to make it tricky to do those retrospectives when I'm trying to find some of those old shows. Right. I mean, unless you got the DVD, I mean, you really would have to, (laughs) you would have to, we had to do the retrospective probably two weeks in advance 
because it's going to take a week to find the damn show. <laughs> wow. <coughs> but whatever. Um, so coming up, the next episode, I don't know when um, WrestleMania, or back, or the Backlash, WrestleMania Revenge, whatever. The, whatever it's done. WrestleMania Backlash. It's not just Backlash, it's WrestleMania Backlash. So stupid. Um, in fact, since I'm here, I'm going to look it up. That way I know. Oh, okay, I was just doing the same thing. When uh, we'll be ready to record that. Um, coming up, oh, it's not until May 16th, so we got some time. Yeah. So the next episode of 3G W will be stepping out of the wrestling ring. But it is still combat of the mortal type. Ah. It is a movie review of Mortal Kombat. That will be our next podcast next week. We'll be reviewing um, Mortal Kombat along with MJ Book from the Countdown Podcast. We'll be doing that. It'll be the next episode. We went a long time for Mortal Kombat. Well, at least myself and Book have. Rob's watched the movie, so he'll be on the show as well. But uh, we've we've been looking for so it'll be, there'll be some different perspectives. It'll be interesting to see. I've definitely been interested to get your perspective on it as um, someone that's not really as much of a fan. But I know you're familiar with the. Everybody's familiar with the game. I mean, you'd have to be living under a rock half your life to not know what Mortal Kombat is, you know. So. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that'll be an interesting one to get into. That will be the next episode. And then, well, we won't have, we won't have a pay-per-view till May 16th, so we'll have to figure out uh, what, what we'll do in between then. And, uh, well, we'll see. So thank you all for listening. We hope you all have uh, been doing well <laughs> in our absence. Uh, but but make sure you go back and listen to our WrestleMania post show. Um, we had we had a good time. Had the whole crew in in staying in my house, and we reviewed WrestleMania immediately after the show went off the air, and it was interesting. We we kept score. We did predictions on the board. There was plenty of food and drinks. Uh, it was a good time, and yeah. And, I really hope to do it more often, and hopefully we can do it at WrestleMania. Man, I hope so, too. And, you know, you can also watch it. Yes. If you are kind of curious what we all look like, uh, you know, I'm sitting at a profile. My profile is not my best look. But, yeah, I mean, we, we recorded it, and it's on YouTube. So if you're just kind of curious to put a face with a voice, uh, you can also check us out on YouTube for those two shows. Yes, we can. Uh, night two is only is, is is shorter. It's a shorter clip, but night one is the full podcast. You can listen. You can watch, as you said, you can watch our whole podcast. Night one WrestleMania. It is on YouTube now. Just search Third Gen Wrestling on YouTube and give us a follow. We'll be posting clips on there. All I've I've been posting clips on there from our shows recently, so. You miss clips of our podcast, clips from live wrestling events we've gone to. So there's plenty of clips. And our podcast episodes get posted to YouTube as well. So definitely check it out. Definitely check it out. Um, and if you're more so a streamer, you can download our shows from Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podbean, and Spotify. Make sure you give us a follow on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Third Generation Wrestling Podcast. Been a little more active on Twitter. Um, we got a lot of feedback from the tweet from uh, night one of WrestleMania. When I, uh, I tweeted that, you know, Bianca Belair should definitely buy a slice of banks of beer after that that whip. Oh, and man. That, that got a lot of feedback for sure. Well, bro, that, I mean, look, she left a mark. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that was no joke. I don't know what she puts in that hair. <laughs> but man, she tore Sasha up with that. Yeah. So yeah, definitely check that out. 
And uh, give us a follow on all our social media platforms. We thank you all for listening again. Hope you enjoyed this countdown. And we'll speak to you all again next week when we're talking Mortal Kombat.